Father in heaven, we come before you this Sabbath evening, walking in faith, believing in our hearts that you have risen from the grave. Paul said that if there is no resurrection, then our faith is in vain. But Peter come along and said the tomb was empty, so we believe. Help us understand as we walk through the life of Mary how it applies to us in our own individual lives and as our lives as a group but as a collective. Lord, you cast seven demons out of her. How many have you done for us that we don't even know about? We thank you for that. Lord, we ask and pray for the Holy Spirit to descend upon us, open our hearts and our minds to hear your word. Speak through Pastor Dave now. Guide his words so that he speaks only from heaven. And these things we ask and pray in your loving name, Jesus. Amen. Well, good evening. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight to... Uh, to this uh, beginning of these uh, presentations. And um, uh, a lot of thank yous need to go out to, uh, to everyone who helped. Um, I know Rachel did a lot coordinating from the office, but the musicians, the audio uh, team, Robert, thank you so much, and, and uh, those running video as well. And Irene has been very busy getting things set up. And um, Irene, you, if we can switch to, uh, to my slides, uh, that would be great. Um, but I also wanted to mention um, there's another very important thing happening this weekend in Journey to the Cross, and I just wanted to be clear, we're not trying in any way to compete with that program. Uh, that is a, a, an excellent Adventist presentation to our community. Many of our people are there volunteering or maybe uh, going through the walkthrough experience, and I think that's wonderful. Um, I just think it's a, a, a great opportunity, though, even, even when uh, another great option is taking place nearby. Uh, this is the most significant event, the resurrection, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, His burial and resurrection, that has taken place in the history of the universe. Is, is there any doubt in your mind about that? In, in the history of everything, there's nothing more significant then the death of the Son of God as a sacrifice for our sins, his burial and being placed in the tomb and then coming out alive. Nothing more significant. So I, I just, uh, uh, I have a, uh, a deep conviction that we should honor that and by spending a few moments together over this weekend to contemplate um, some principles from that. You know, Mrs. White says, uh, it, it would do well if we spent a thoughtful hour every day contemplating the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. I don't think I got that quite correct. So this is something that really is a, uh, uh, an exercise that we should be doing every day. Every day we should be contemplating, meditating on, studying, appreciating the life of Jesus Christ and particularly and especially... Um, the, the story of his sacrifice, his death, and resurrection. So for our, our theme, and again, I should thank Pastor Gerald as well because uh, he stepped in uh, to, to, to share the middle message here tomorrow morning, and we've been collaborating on that, and um, I know that the Lord will, will guide and bless. Before we go on, though, um, I'd like to say one more prayer. Is that okay? God, we, uh, we come before you tonight, and Lord, as the Sabbath begins, what a joy it is to be in your house and with your people, Lord. And Father, we pray that your presence uh, would honor us as well and come and be in our midst 
that it would be in our hearts and that we would know that you have touched us tonight and throughout this weekend, Father. We do pray for uh, the Spokane Valley Church and for the thousands of people who will go through that walkthrough experience. I pray that that would be a successful, wonderful event. I know there are other churches, Adventist churches as well. Um, uh, Coeur d'Alene often does the borrowed tomb, but whatever programs are going on, Lord, we pray that this would be a powerful weekend for the proclamation of the gospel, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if it's okay with you, I'm going to uh, borrow this. Actually, I'll leave the music there. We're a smaller group tonight. Can I come down off the platform? Abel, can I come? Abel says I can come down. So I'm going to, um, you know, we're just a family here tonight, aren't we? And um, let me grab my, my sword here. The cross through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. Um, you know, we actually, when we began uh, planning for this, I was calling it the cross through the eyes of Mary. And, um, um, oh, and I should also thank Ted uh, Bertu for the uh, graphic that he designed. And we thought, well, you know, there's so many Marys in the Bible, we need to clarify. Is this the mother of Jesus? Is this some other Mary? So then we extended it to be Mary Magdalene. I think she's one of the most fascinating characters in all of Scripture. Uh, and I think that she had a unique experience with Jesus, unlike anyone else. And I, I think it's valuable to spend a few moments evaluating her encounter with Jesus Christ uh, through a variety of situations leading up to, uh, to uh, the resurrection. And so tonight, we're going to be looking at a very familiar story in particular, but perhaps just a little, um, a little preview here. Um, Oh, that is, well, you can see it better than I can. You know, there were actually many women who were followers of Jesus. It probably wouldn't be technically accurate to call them disciples because in the Jewish age and culture, only a, a male could be a disciple of a rabbi. There could be a ladies uh, following as well, and, uh, um, uh, but they wouldn't be in the school of the rabbi. They wouldn't be in a discipleship program. But there were uh, many women that were intimately following Jesus with passion and with faith. And we can read about a few of them here in Luke 8. Um, of course, Mary Magdalene is mentioned, but then there's also Joanna and Susanna. Just little brief windows. We don't know a lot about these ladies, but they are mentioned. Of course, uh, we know of Mary and uh, uh, Martha of Bethany. Uh, those are two ladies that uh, we're familiar of stories about them and their devotion to Jesus. And in, in the crucifixion, uh, there's the presence of the women in several places, actually. And Matthew actually says, many women. It's actually an indication that there was uh, several women that were watching uh, the events of the crucifixion, and Matthew says these were women who had followed him from his Galilean years. Um, so probably his second tour of ministry in Galilee is when many of these women uh, became devoted believers and followers uh, of Jesus Christ. And then there's the, the historical three Marys, the three Marys, and they're given such brief mentions. We don't know a lot about them. There's some theories about who they are, um, and, and we do know one of them was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, Mary Magdalene was clearly one of them, but there's, there's other names given there, and uh, because of the, the brevity of the references, it's not clear exactly who they are. Even Salome is mentioned, um, but that may have just been another name for one of the other Marys. And you can look through all four Gospels that talk about the women that were watching the crucifixion of Jesus. Um, now, I want to make something very clear uh, tonight. In our, uh, in our age in which we live, in the culture in which we live, the, the subject of, of women following Jesus and the role of women serving Jesus is a, a very challenging topic. And I want us to attempt to, tonight to not politicize the discussion. If I, is that fair? Can I say that? I realize that uh, there are those who feel very passionately one way or the other, and, and I respect that immensely. I'm not making a political uh, de uh, uh, debate tonight, um, and I'm, I'm trying to be somewhat coy about saying that. I'm not trying to elevate or escalate anything other than what Scripture says. 
about these ladies. So I just wanted to say that and, and leave that uh, there. So uh, there were all of these uh, women who were dedicated uh, uh, followers of Jesus, including uh, the two that were mentioned, Susanna and Joanna, uh, in Luke chapter 8, says they were supporting Jesus out of their means. So and it's, it's quite easy to say that without the support of these ladies, the ministry of Jesus uh, would have languished. Of course, he would have found the resources one way or another, but they were financially providing for them as they went about their means. And so there was a, a good group of, of ladies. But I want to focus in on one lady in particular um, as a focus, and that's Mary Magdalene. And just a few comments about Mary. Um, as I mentioned, there's lots of Marys in the New Testament. Mary is, of course, just the Greek translation of the Hebrew name Miriam. Miriam, and so you can imagine that there was a great deal of uh, excitement about naming your daughter after the great uh, matriarch of Miriam. So, so Mary was a very common name, and that does lead to some difficulty in, in identifying some of the characters uh, because so many of them had the name Mary. There's at least eight different Marys or eight unique stories about a Mary in the New Testament. Um, but the question is, are they all different or are they the same? Of course, the three most famous Marys are Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and then Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha. Those are the three probably most famous that occupy the most of, of Scripture when we were talking about characters by the name of Mary. But then there's this question about, is Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany really the same person? And in theological cir uh, circles, they actually call that the composite Mary. Is Mary, are these two different people or are they the same? And just for the sake of, of, uh, 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 of not uh, belaying the debate, I believe they are the same. And, and in, in Desire of Ages, uh, Mrs. White treats them as the same uh, people. There's, there's actually uh, 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 quite a bit of Scripture that uh, if you read it with an open mind, it's quite clear that Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene are indeed the same Mary. And we could go through that evidence tonight, but um, I'm just going to ask you to bear with me. But then there's a third element of identifying who Mary is, and that's the, uh, the woman caught in adultery, only found in the Gospel of John. Only found in John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptics do not record this story. And there's a big question. She's not named by John, but who was she? Is it possible that this is also Mary Magdalene? And uh, I'll just submit to you tonight, uh, it is a matter of, of, of opinion. Um, it is a matter of, of discussion. But I'll submit to you tonight, I think it is. I think the woman caught in adultery is indeed Mary Magdalene. Now, um, because of my respect um, for, for Desire of Ages and the comments of Ellen White, I did just a little research. There's no definitive statement that she makes about this, but let me just share with you what she does say that helps lead me to the conclusion that in the mind of Ellen White, they were one and the same person. This is her comments about the woman caught in, in adultery and desire of ages. The penitent woman, this penitent woman became one of his most steadfast followers. With self-sacrificing love and devotion, she repaid his forgiving mercy. Very lovely statement. It would seem to apply to what we know of Mary Magdalene. But then look at what she says in another place, specifically about Mary Magdalene. This is from Spirit of Prophecy, volume 2. And I put it in a different color. She, she says this, On the other hand, Mary was thoroughly penitent. Look at the word. And humbled because of her sins. In her gratitude for His pardoning mercy, she was ready to sacrifice all for Jesus. It, um, uh, it oh, I can't read it. Uh, and no doubt as to his divine power troubled her mind for a moment. Now, if you look at these two passages carefully, they're almost identical. Look what she says here. They were both penitent. As a matter of fact, this is the only person, or these two statements are the only times where she uses that idea of a woman being penitent using that specific language. It's only in these places, referring to the Mary who anointed Jesus, and that's Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, and the woman caught in adultery. That's the only time she uses that phraseology of, um, of a woman being penitent. And then she says, um, 
with self-sacrificing love, but in the spirit of prophecy, she says she was ready to sacrifice all. Very similar language. Then she says uh, his forgiving mercy or his pardoning mercy. Again, almost the same uh, 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 way of defining it. And then talking about she was a steadfast follower, whereas the lower quote says she had no doubt as to a divine power uh, that troubled her mind even for a moment. So is it, is it absolutely definitive? Can I, can I twist your arm tonight? And can I force you to believe that the woman caught in adultery was Mary Magdalene? No, I can't do that. I simply submit to you that the characteristics that we find in Scripture and of what would appear to be a consistent statement from Mrs. White would lead me to believe that it was her conviction uh, uh, that Mary Magdalene was the woman caught in adultery, but... Um, it is uh, up to you to decide. But if you just consider for a moment, if Mary Magdalene is all three of those things, if she's the Mary Magdalene that we read of in Scripture, and she's the Mary of Bethany, and she's the woman caught in adultery, if she is all three of those, do you realize what that means about this one individual in the New Testament? It means that second to Peter, Mary Magdalene is the most prominent and important person, of course, not including our Savior, but Mary Magdalene would be the most prominent and important person in the gospel stories, second only to Peter. She speaks more, she appears more, she does more than any of the other major characters, including the other 11 disciples. Many of the disciples we have no dialogue from, nothing. I think Simon the Zealot is one of them. We never, and I, forgive me, this is just my memory here, but I don't think we have any dialogue from Simon the Zealot or James the Less. We have a few statements of the other Judas. We have a few statements of Nathaniel. Philip plays a little bit larger role in the New Testament. James and John are often seen, and they play a very prominent role. But Mary Magdalene, if, if we do come to that conclusion, would appear more and speak more than any of the other disciples save Peter. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever thought about that before? Isn't that a striking revelation? Because when you think of the great individuals of the New Testament, uh, oftentimes um, this individual is not, I believe, given the appropriate acknowledgement. Mary Magdalene. So, um, the cross through the eyes of Mary. Now, um, the story I want to take us to tonight is the anointing of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at two different passages of that story. I'm going to read one, and then the other one I'll have up on the screen that we can look at. Um, you're familiar with this story, and I'm going to read it from Mark. Here, Mark chapter 14. Matthew and Mark give almost an identical story here. Each of the Gospels gives a little bit of a different perspective on this story. Um, as Ross mentioned, Mary Magdalene had been one of Jesus's earliest followers. Magdala was a town on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee, um, and so uh, she obviously had some connection with that town, but if she is also Mary of Bethany, she also had a connection with that town, Bethany just outside of Jerusalem, and the way in which uh, scholars who uh, embrace the same Mary. They say she probably was from Bethany. That's where her hometown was, but she probably lived and worked in the Galilean region of Magdala. But anyways, um, and also, yes, uh, uh, Ross had mentioned that in Luke chapter 8, um, uh, Luke says that Mary had been delivered of seven demons. And even the Greek itself there in this passage is a little unclear of whether it means she had seven demons at once, like the demoniac who was filled with legion. You know, there, was many, uh, uh, soul, there were many uh, uh, imps that were possessing that individual, or whether it means that she'd been delivered seven times. It's unclear. It can be interpreted either way. But we're talking about an individual who, if it, if, again, if it is a woman caught in adultery, she's an adulteress. She is under demonic influence, and she is a pretty desperate and pathetic soul. But Jesus had come into her life, and early in His ministry, she had become a devoted follower, um, coming out of Galilee and being identified as one of the women who was uh, uh, around Jesus following Him. 
Up until the, uh, the closing scenes of Jesus' life, Mary had been very involved. And we're familiar with this story in, John, in, excuse me, in Mark chapter 14. And again, I'm just going to read it here out of my Bible, beginning in verse 3. And I know you know this story well. While he was in Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper, Jesus, of course, is at, in the home of Simon the leper, reclining at the table, there came a woman... She's not named here, with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume of pure nard. She broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignant, remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? Kind of an interesting thought. It's been wasted because it was being used to anoint our Lord, but that was the comment, and we know who made that comment, don't we? Another one of the Gospels says it was who? Judas Iscariot. It was Judas uh, who was uh, having some very selfish thoughts at this moment. Why was this perfume wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii. That's more than a year's wage. And denarii was a day's wage for 12 hours of work. All right? A day's wage for 12 hours of work. Okay, 300 denarii, that would be over a year's wage. This perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. Very altruistic, very lovely. Oh, all I'm thinking about is the poor. And they were scolding her. But listen to this. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She's done a good deed for me. You always have the poor with you. And wherever you wish, uh, whenever you wish, you can... Uh, do good to them, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. For the burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken in memory of her. One of the greatest accolades given by our Lord One of the greatest honors ever spoken by Jesus to another human individual is right here when Jesus says, wherever this gospel, wherever this truth is preached in the world, what this woman has done will be included in that message. And I've heard scholars and and, and theologians comment how, how, how this, this uh, statement of Jesus has become true and how many world leaders, how many great philosophers, how many great thinkers have come onto the scene of history and done great things, but they have faded into the footnote of the historical record and we don't even know them. But wherever Jesus is known on our planet, this story is accompanied with that and the, the deed of Mary Magdalene is remembered. That's remarkable. That's absolutely remarkable. And we shouldn't pass over that. She has anointed my body beforehand for my burial. Now, up until this point, how many people in this uh, grouping that Jesus was with, including his disciples, including many who believed, including Simon the leper, a Pharisee who had become a believer in Jesus, a leper who had been healed by Jesus. How many of them in around that circle believed that Jesus was only hours away from death? How many? There was, n- there was none save one. Only one. Mary had heard Jesus talking about his upcoming crucifixion, about how he'd be handed over to the Gentiles, how he would die on a cross and be buried, and Mary heard that, and Mary believed, while even his own disciples said, not so, Lord, that will never happen to you. What kind of test is this? What kind of joke are you trying to pull? Of course, that's you're the king. We're going to Jerusalem so you can be coronated. What is this you're talking about uh, being handed? They didn't even give it a passing thought. But Mary believed. Mary was prepared for his burial. Very interesting. I'll take you now to the the gospel of Luke, and that's the story. And this time I do have it on the screen if if you want to follow along there. Again, each gospel writer gives a, an, an additional perspective to this story, a different angle to look at it by. And um, I want us to see Luke's version of it here, Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36, as, uh, as we continue to look at the cross 
through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. Again, it opens up very similar. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting Jesus to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. There was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, let me ask you this. What would make a woman identified as a sinner in in the Jewish culture? There There were many things that could be But the most prominent, the most obvious, the most uh, heinous that would identify someone as being so repulsive that no prophet should ever come into contact with them would be only a prostitute or an adulteress, which is another line of evidence that leads me to the conclusion that the woman caught in adultery was indeed the same as the woman who anoints his feet, which would be Mary Magdalene. But this is what they say. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. I mean, that was the title they gave her. Now, if you were a Jewish man, there were three things in general that you could do that would make you a sinner. One, you could be a tax collector. You're a tax collector, doesn't matter what else you do, you're automatically a sinner. Two, you are um, a Sabbath breaker. If you are a Sabbath breaker, you would be automatically given into the context of a sinner. And the third one is if you did not follow the Mosaic dietary laws, if you violated those in a prominent way, that would be something that would identify you as a sinner. But it was different for a, a woman. And Luke says, everyone who saw this person realized who she was, that she was a sinner. And when she learned that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. I, I want to get one of these. I, wouldn't it be a neat little object to be able to hold up? I, I didn't have enough time to you know, eBay it and get one or anything like that. Alabaster is a material similar to marble. It's white, it's very light, and uh, it's very carvable. And so they would use alabaster to be a, uh, a very precious uh, container Uh, for all kinds of things, but obviously uh, perfumers and special oils and spices would be kept in an alabaster vial. Now, the other gospel stories tell us what kind of perfume it was. Do you remember what what it was called? Nard or spike nard. And we actually know what that is. There's, there's relatively good biblical evidence to identify precisely the spice and the fragrance that it was. Spikenard is derived from a flower that grows only in the Himalayan region. That's all, the only place you can find it. It's a, it's a flower. It is a, uh, an essential oil that is derived from a flower that's only found in northern India and southern China in the area of the mountain slopes of the Himalayan uh, mountain range. And the, 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 that's why it was so valuable because the spice traders and the caravans would bring this precious oil uh, a perfume and this uh, precious oil, and they would bring it to Persia, they bring it to uh, the area of Iran, and then it would get traded, and then it would come uh, across the Fertile Crescent into Israel. So it, was, it took a great distance to get it there. It took a great amount of it to make it of any substantial quantity. It was a thick oil, too, almost like motor oil. It wasn't watery. It wasn't runny. It was quite thick, not as thick as like molasses, but very thick and extremely fragrant. (coughs) Um, If you were to open even just a small, I actually keep a uh, a little thing of oil in my Bible here, which is really neat because it leaks a little, and then it gets in my Bible, and so every time I open my Bible, ooh, it smells like myrrh. That's really cool. It's kind of an after uh, product of deciding to store this in my Bible. But if you were to open um, a thing of spikenard, even as small as this, it would fill a room like this almost instantly. It is incredibly fragrant, incredibly valuable, and only used in very uh, special circumstances. So now why did Mary have this to begin with? What business does a prostitute have in, in having a, 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 a vial of precious perfume that costs us essentially what an automobile would cost? Why did she have it? <coughs> She bought it for Jesus. She bought it because she heard of Jesus' upcoming death, and she wanted Jesus to have the most important and precious embalming fragrance. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) 
Um, so she goes out and she buys this. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you, would you thank you so much? Let me ask you a question. How did she afford it? Where does a woman like this get a year's wage to purchase such a valuable thing? Where'd she get it? Her savings? Yeah, and how did she get her savings? What was her profession? She used the proceeds of her adultery. Again, if, if these stories are accurate, if the uh, theories are, are um, accepted, that is a, a likelihood um, that uh, this was part of her income that she had received while living as a sinner. Interesting thought, at least. So she brings the vial of perfume, and she intended now, now, she intended to use it for his burial. But during the feast, during the experience in Simon's house, she hears the other disciples talking. She hears Simon talking, and all she hears from them is, oh, Jesus, we're heading to Jerusalem, and you're going to become king, and you're going to be overthrow the Romans, and we're going to coronate you, and you're going to live, and you're going to be like King David on his throne. You're going to have the wisdom of Solomon. All she can hear about is their discussion about how Jesus is going to live. And here she's holding this precious uh, oil, this precious fragrance that she's been keeping for his burial, <coughs> and it causes some confusion in her, and she decides in her heart, I don't want to miss an opportunity to bless my Lord. If he's not going to die, if he's not going to be buried, I don't want to miss the opportunity. I'm going to go ahead and anoint him while he lives. And so she went and she got her alabaster vial, and she very nonchalantly, she does not try to make a scene. She doesn't waltz into the group and announce herself and say, everybody look at me while I go and do this grand and marvelous thing. Oh, no, that doesn't fit the story at all. She very quietly steps behind our Lord. It says, and standing behind him at his feet. Now, we know that she had also anointed his head, but at this point, she's moved down and she's anointing his feet. And it says, weeping. Why was she weeping? Gratitude, gratefulness, joy. I, I had read this story before and I'd not really looked into it and I thought she was uh, weeping for out of some kind of sadness, but I think you're absolutely right. She had been healed of seven demons. She had been humiliated in the temple and yet Jesus would look into her eyes and say, neither do I condemn you go and sin no more. It was out of sheer gratefulness and gratitude and love that the emotions well up in her. And she begins to weep. She begins to weep with such ferocity that the tears are literally soaking the feet of Jesus. And so what does she do? She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair, this long, dark Jewish hair unfurls it from her, and she takes it, and she begins to wipe his feet. Now, at this point, it is impossible for people not to notice. Wiping them with the hair of her head, kissing his feet, and anointing them um, with the perfume, the fragrance of an entire vial. You know, Mark says she broke the vial, okay? She didn't pull the cork off and, and just uh, sprinkle a little bit. I mean, the, the vial was broken and the entire contents of a year's uh, value of this incredibly fragrant perfume in this enclosed space, it would have been impossible for anyone not to notice unless you had gone uh, blind in your nostrils. <laughs> and this woman weeping, weeping at his feet and taking her hair and washing his feet um, un, 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 a bit, you'd be just impossible not to notice that. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, he does not blast it out. He's, he's kind of speaking under his breath or maybe even in his own heart. If this man were a prophet, now up until this point, Simon was a believer. <coughs> He'd been healed of leprosy. That's what he was known, Simon the leper. He had leprosy and Jesus had, had miraculously healed him. 
But because of this woman's actions, because of Mary Magdalene, he says to himself, now if he were a prophet, there's no way he would allow this woman. What sort of a person? Uh, He would know who and what sort of person this woman is who's touching him, that she's a sinner. Now, an interesting side note here is that um, uh, uh, we're told through Ellen White that Simon had been one that had led her into sin. He was intimately aware of her sin, which makes this a statement all the more uh, troubling coming from this Pharisee. He still had too much Pharisee in him, apparently. But if he were a prophet, he would know. So I'm starting to wonder, maybe he's not the guy I thought he was because of what this this, uh, woman is doing. And Jesus answered him, Simon... I have something to say to you. Now, Simon doesn't realize that Jesus knows exactly what he had been saying. He thought he was saying it to himself. And by the way, there's a lesson in that, isn't there? You cannot whisper something to yourself without Jesus knowing exactly what's in your heart. And Jesus knew exactly what was in Simon's heart. And he says, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. And in this very short parable, he says, a money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. (coughs) Now, when they were unable to pay, to repay, he graciously forgave them both. Which of them will love him more? And I think Simon's answer here is a little, a little uh, disingenuous. He answered, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose, just maybe, perhaps it might be the one he forgave more. And Jesus said to him, you have judged correctly. And then he goes on to to lecture him. But look at this. It says, turning toward the woman. Now, I don't know. I can't force upon you tonight that that means that he was looking at Mary. But in my mind's eye, I picture him looking at Mary while talking to Simon. I, I don't know. That, I, that's what I like to think. Uh, so that's when I read this, I see him with his eyes fixed on, on Mary. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's wet my feet with her tears. Wipe them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she's since the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he has been given little loves. He, he has been forgiven little, loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Now, I think it's important to point out that what, what's going on here is not a quid pro quo, okay? This is not uh, Mary uh, uh, approaching Jesus to, for some sort of appeasement, okay? This is not Mary feeling the weight of her sins and looking at Jesus and saying, I have such a burden over my sins. Maybe, just maybe, if I do something wonderful for him, maybe he'll forgive me, okay? This is not, that would be a very pagan way of looking at a, uh, at a relationship with God, this idea of an exchange. If I give you something that's very valuable, will you also give me something that's very valuable? That is not the lesson here. Mary had already been healed, Mary had already been forgiven. What she does for Jesus at this point is out of sheer love and appreciation for him. Does that make sense? It was out of sheer devotion for him that she had gone out and purchased this embalming fragrance. It was out of sheer faith that she approached him in this setting where she was not welcome, where she fairly makes a scene over this experience with Jesus, and it's out of a result of that expression of love that Jesus turns to her and gives her reassurance of her forgiveness. Does that make sense? The priceless gift in this story is not the perfume, okay? The priceless gift is not the perfume. By the way, anytime you give a gift, isn't it a symbol? Isn't every gift a symbol? Every gift is a symbol of some kind. Now, the, the, the gift itself can have value. The gift itself can have a purpose. But anytime you give someone you love a gift, it is a symbol of your love, isn't it? Every gift is a symbol. 
And so the symbol here of the gift, the gift that Mary gives, is a symbol of her love and devotion of Jesus Christ, isn't it? And that's exactly how Jesus interpreted it, that this wonderful benefit that she has given me is a a revelation to everyone who's watching and will forevermore be a revelation to the world and to everyone who studies the gospel of what her faith has done for me. Now remember this, although everyone else in the room was confused about the mission of Jesus, Everyone else in the room is thinking they're headed to Jerusalem so that Jesus can overthrow uh, the Romans, so Jesus can become the, uh, uh, the, the king again, rule on the throne of David. But Jesus knows that only a few days from then, everyone's going to betray him and run, and he's going to die on a Roman cross. And at this very moment, people outside the house are plotting his death. Isn't that right? In that context, in that situation, when everyone in the room is confused about what his mission is, and everyone outside the room is plotting his death, how much do you think it meant to the heart of Jesus to have one soul understand? To have one soul come and show such beautiful love and devotion to him. That was the priceless gift. That is what made such a deep impression on the heart of Jesus. That was the expression that Jesus said, because of this, wherever this gospel is preached, what this woman has done will be a memorial. You know, Jesus only makes those types of statements a few times about people having such a, an exalted status of their name being recognized in heaven. You have John the Baptist, where Jesus says, among those born of women, no greater prophet is coming except for John the Baptist, he's a certainly elevated individual. And then 12 apostles too, they are part of the foundation of the city, of the New Jerusalem. Wonderful accolade, but that only happens so often. <coughs> Excuse me. And of, of those people that Jesus remarks that will have such a, a wonderful memorial of their devotion comes this story of Mary anointing his feet. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man? who even forgives sins. Do you believe Jesus can forgive your sins? The tragedy is that for three and a half years, Jesus had been trying to make it clear to everyone who loved him, everyone who followed him, that he was the lamb that had the power to forgive sins. And here, just hours before his crucifixion, there are still some of his closest disciples, some of his closest companions, still doubting and confused that the Son of Man has the power to forgive your sins. Who is this man who even forgives sins? What a tragedy. What an insult. But he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Again, a very similar statement when you think about the the woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Very similar. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Mary was one who saw further, who saw more. Yes, a confusion arose in the story because of the, the talk of Jesus not dying, but living and, and, and reigning as a king. But she was one who had sacrificed so much to bring to Jesus, to anoint him uh, and, and to do that wonderful honor for him. And Jesus says, do not stop her from doing this because she's done it for my burial. And as a result of this story, Jesus looks at Mary and reconfirms her redemption, reconfirms that indeed she was living in a state of forgiveness. 
she was living in a state of being connected with God. Despite her failings, despite her sins, despite everyone doubting her, there was one person who would look upon her and not see a sinner, not see a prostitute, not see someone oppressed by demons, but to see a daughter and to see a child that had been changed and redeemed. So in exchange, not only does Mary give Jesus an enormously priceless gift, but in return, Jesus gives her an eternal gift, the promise of eternal life because of her forgiveness. Again, it's hard to study um, anyone who has a greater uh, uh, appreciation for Jesus during this time than Mary Magdalene. It was Mary who understood that a great sacrifice had been spoken by Jesus. It was Mary who had prepared for that sacrifice. It would be Mary who would watch the cross the longest. It would be Mary who was the last to leave the tomb on Friday night as the Sabbath was beginning. It was Mary who would be the first to go to the tomb Sunday morning. It would be Mary to be the first to hear the angelic record of His resurrection. It would be Mary who would be the first to proclaim a risen Savior. Mary is someone worth looking at, and that's what we're going to do this weekend. Is that okay? So we're going to go ahead and and close with a word of prayer here now, and uh, again, I just want to thank you so much. For, for coming tonight and to all of those who are helping to make this, uh, this little series happen. We just sure appreciate it. Will you bow your heads with me? <clears throat> Gracious God in heaven, you have given us so many wonderful uh, uh, aspects to appreciate and study when it comes to this event, which again cannot be overemphasized, the single most important event in the history of the universe. And you've given us so many windows of understanding and appreciating how this event applies to our lives and what it means for our faith. Lord, I pray that you would bless us as we worship together this Sabbath. I pray that as people come, that they would sense your spirit, that they would appreciate your great sacrifice, that we would all be enlightened once more as to our role in accepting by faith your sacrifice for us and the promise of the redemption of our sins, that we could all be like Mary, who would love and appreciate you so much that we would be willing to sacrifice and come before you out of love and devotion, and that we could hear you say to our hearts as well that we loved much and that our sins are forgiven. Lord, it's something we need to do every day. So bless us in this endeavor. Help us to see your plan. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. That concludes our Vespers for tonight. And I pray that you have a a wonderful evening and uh, that you come back tomorrow morning for the worship service. Hi, I'm Dave Lounsbury, and I'm the pastor here at the Spokane Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I want to thank you for joining us with our worship today. Whether you're watching on channel 14 or on our YouTube channel or some other way, we're thankful that you've joined us. If you happen to live in the Spokane area, we'd be delighted to have you come and worship with us. We're located at 828 West Spofford on the north side of Spokane, and we'd be delighted to get to know you. If you're interested in Bible study, we love to do Bible studies as well. You can contact us through our website or through email or through phone or through a variety of ways, and all that information's at the end of the video. But come and visit us sometime and visit us often here on YouTube or Channel 14 as well. God bless you.